Well, welcome to all of you. My name is Jerry Pearl Jr. I'm the president of the Wallington Preservation Trust. We're always happy to partner with the library and have a full house um, at all of these joint events. You know, this month during March, we are celebrating Women's History Month and the International Day of the Woman. And, you know, we can think of history in those broad strokes, like you will hear at our property, George Washington, silverware. Um, but a lot of those stories are fairly male dominated. Um, and we have a duty to make sure that what we tell people is filled out, that it tells the stories of others. Um, so certainly this evening's program um, highlighting dress, it's one of those things that um, less attention historically has been paid to, um, but there are lots of pieces of dress and textiles out there that lend to our understanding of what people's lives were in the past. Um, there are a number of people I should thank for putting together uh, this evening's program. Certainly Rachel from the library um, has led the way on so much of this. Um, the director of operations from the trust, Lorraine Connolly, who's here. Um, Mary Tiberi, who is one of the trust trustees, um, is an extensive collector of textiles and clothing um, and really said, this is something we've got to look at and has personally uh, loaned some items from her own collection. Dick Straub is in the back. Dick is the glue that keeps all the trust volunteers put together, many of whom are here this evening. Um, and one of uh, whom, Brittany Barto, is hiding behind the curtain here um, and has done so much to help us catalog the items um, at both the Royce House and the Johnson Mansion. On April 14th, if you've been waiting, both um, the Johnson Mansion on South Main and the Royce House on North Main will be open for an open, open house um, in the afternoon. So please stop by. And if you haven't had your fill of Victorian things, on May the 11th, we're having our second annual Victorian tea. We do need renovations. Um, okay, wave your hand back there. That's that's the person to see about reservations. She'll she'll get you hooked up with the seat. So um, glad you can all be here. I'm sure it's a great night. And now on to rent. Hey everyone, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, I have a loud voice anyway, so if, if I'm too loud, just go <laughs> and I, I'll be quieter. Um, thank you so much for all being here, and thank you to everyone, Rachel included, everybody for having me here. Um, I live in Vermont, but it seems like a long way to go, but it's worth it. I love traveling New England and doing these presentations. I've been doing them since 2012. I did the history of the Titanic um, as my first one uh, because of the anniversary in 2012. And that's how I knew that you're my audience. You, you love being here. I went back to school in the, when I was in my 40s and went into historic dress at University of Rhode Island. And I got a master's in that because they have a, a concentration, which I didn't even know until I spoke to a friend and he told me. So I went back to school and taught for 13 years um, in colleges which was wonderful until I started doing these. And then I said, no, no, this is my audience. They get it. They, they're they here and they understand. They don't, not that the runway fashion isn't interesting, but um, the kids, most of them wanted to hear about that, not about the historic. So this is my passion. So thank you again for being here. Um, I do have a lot of slides and a couple of videos. So I will go through them, not too, too slowly. That way you won't be here till midnight. But there's just so much to talk about on uh, the Gilded Age, so, so much. And fashion is a big part of it because it speaks, it just like it does now, it speaks to the zeitgeist of the times and what was going on at the time. And, you know, you will be looking at mostly the, what the wealthy wore because that's what survived um, because it was very well made. Um, it was not worn until it, you know, fell apart. It usually was passed along 
or just stopped, uh, they stopped wearing it when it was out of date. Maybe they gave it to servants. So uh, mostly we're talking about the upper classes, but we will talk a little bit too about what the, the lower classes and the working classes wore because believe it or not, they tried to stay in fashion as well. Okay, so um, the Gilded Age, you know, you'll hear different things about the actual um, years. So some people say right after the Civil War, you know, right after the Civil War, some people say, no, it's like 67-ish and on. Some people say it stops at 1900 and some people say it stops quite a bit into that first decade of the 20th century. So we're just going to cover uh, mostly just the last part of the 19th century. And we'll call that a day because, again, we can go on and on and until we get to the, you know, into the progressive era. So um, I am going to start talking about why the Gilded Age was called the Gilded Age. So we'll have that slide, please. Okay. As most of you or, or all of you know, this was a time of incredible growth in America. We know economically, industrialization, the railroads, all of these things. And of course, with uh, immigration, the population exploded. And so now we're looking at the country moving out west as well. So now uh, there's more farmland and prairies and just more and more people are coming to be able to make money in this country. So there was that. Um, this also overlaps with Reconstruction right after the Civil War and everything that was going on with that. Uh, so again, railroads, by, by 1869, we had the Transcontinental Railroad finish. Small factories, of course, banks, department stores, which you'll see a few of those. Uh, mines like silver mines and other family-owned enterprises were big. Steel production surpassed Britain, Germany, and France. So that was pretty huge. Millions of farms, like I said, prairie region especially. Cities exploded. Just think about New York City, of course. You've got Philadelphia. You've got, you know, all of those cities. Of course, Boston was a smaller city, but was growing anyway. And all of these immigrants coming from Europe. Um, and they were drawn by the steamship enterprises, the railroad, even the farms that they could, they could get work at. And, of course... We know that the potato famine that happened in Ireland and then some uh, difficulties in Europe with, with Germany. There was an influx within a few years of the Irish and uh, the German immigrants as well. And in terms of fashion, the sewing machine, by 1889, over 3 million homes had a sewing machine. And that's important because that's going to help women uh, of all classes to make fashionable clothing. So just that little tidbit alone to get you thinking about fashion. Even some of the magazines of the day, like the Delineator, had Butterick patterns in them so that women could get the latest fashions from Paris and make their own clothing at home. So that's important to think about. It's not just the very wealthy that can dress well. If you can sew on a sewing machine, I would have been really, it would have been really bad for me because I, I'm terrible. You don't want me sewing anything. But anyway, okay. <laughs> I'm pointing to it. We know we, we've got this little thing going here. Okay, of course, immigration. I think it was 1892 when they opened Ellis Island, had the special place for the immigrants to come in. Think about what would have happened if we didn't have that. Look at all of the workers who came to us and worked in those factories and helped make the clothing and helped you know, helped in the mines, helped with production of everything we were producing in this country. And that led to a lot of overcrowding. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit, especially New York um, in, a, in a little bit. Okay, also, you know, you have old money, right? And old money, think about the Astors, think about some of the other, uh, uh, well, yeah, they were new money, but the, the Shermahorns, think about Mrs. Astor. She was a Shermahorn and so this is the Dutch, the people that um, formed New Amsterdam. Goes way back to the 1600s. New money wasn't respected because they didn't have that background. They didn't have that um, pedigree, right, of coming from here. They were considered 
oh, they're, you know, they just coming over from Europe and they're just, just making all the money and trying to get into society. Well, if Mrs. Astor had her way, none of them wouldn't, would have gotten in, but they did <laughs> eventually. But so you have people like Rockefeller with Stand Standard Oil on View Carnegie with steel and J.P. Morgan with banking and many others, of course, the Vanderbilts. And robber barons were what they were called because they were coming and they were making a lot of money off the backs of other people who were doing the work and not making much money at all, as we know. Um, the labor mu union uh, started to really heat up. If you watch the Gilded Age, uh, HBO's Gilded Age, Julian Fellows, then you know you've seen the scene of that big problem with the shooting and the, and the labor. And that was what happened. There was a lot of violence in terms of unfair working conditions, as we know. Um, I mean, I'm sure you well know, this is, goes a little past the Gilded Age, but the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, this was a factory that um, made nothing but women's blouses, which were called shirtwaists. And uh, I think it was over, was it over 200 women or over 100 women? I can never remember the number, but um, thank you. So it was close to 200, thank you. That women who passed away because they couldn't get out of the burning building. And that was 1911. So unfortunately, uh, these laws and you know safety practices often don't happen until tragedy strikes and then um, where I'm, I'm from Rhode Island originally, and before I moved out of Rhode Island, we had the um, <clears throat> the, Clyde, the Station nightclub fire that you've heard of, and that was because of the pyrotechnics, and um, people, uh, over 100 people died at that, too. I mean, I'm just speaking of the dangers. I mean, this still happens today, as we know, in, in certain factories in other parts of the world. So that was a problem. So no wonder the, the labor unions were, were upset. Upper classes... We have to say, they had money and they did have an opulent lifestyle, which is fascinating to, to see. Um, if you've ever been to the mansions in Newport, you know what I'm talking about. It, it's, it's wonderful. But they were also, many were also philanthropists and they did give a lot of money to charities. So it didn't, I mean, they might've had people living in tenements, but they also gave to the poor at the same time. So it, it's a weird little um, mix of things going on there. And they also um, had endowments of colleges, or, um, institutions like museums and schools and the opera houses. You know about the war between the Academy of Music and the uh, Metropolitan Opera. We know that story too. Very interesting. Um, and then we'll talk about this at the end, but at the end, <clears throat> the Gilded Age pretty much was winding down. They had a panic and a, a you know a recession um, in 1893. And so this whole realignment politically with the 1896 election, and that would lead into the progressive era, which means, you know, at the end of it, so 1896 and forward, things were not going to be as they had been for um, since the, the late 1860s. And then also the end of Reconstruction, we're going back to 18, 1877, that caused a lot of problems because they took away the right to vote. Of course, there's going to be racial violence. I mean, how do you take something away that's such a, an American right? So all of these things happening, good and and bad. Okay. All right, we got to talk about Connecticut. Um, I talked to my ladies, and they said, "Can you talk a little bit about?" I had to look at this stuff. I I did not know a lot about this area, but it's fascinating. You know about the. It's funny. I'm staying in the uh, Hilton Gardens. The, they have the fitness center, which is the Cho Rosemary Fitness Center. I don't know if you knew that. I so I almost took a picture and brought it in with me. But um, so of course, it, it, if I make a mistake on this, somebody just correct me, please, because I, you know I don't know this area as well as you do. But founded in 1890 for girls by Mary Atwater Cho, and in '96 for uh, the judge, her husband, established the school for boys in the same property. And then it was moved by another woman I'll talk about shortly in 1900 to Greenwich for 70 years. And then it came back here, I think in 1971. And then in 74, after this merger, the combined school kept its strength and its roots and really inspired more and more generations of students. So we know that that's been happening uh, at show all along. Here's the Atwater House, I guess the birth, birthplace of Rosemary, again, if I'm 
wrong about any of this, just say, Ren, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, um, but look at that house. So this original was demolished in 1960. I'm right about that, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. See? All right. Here's the judge. Here comes the judge. Here's the judge, William G. Cho and Mary Atwater Cho. Love those portraits. I just love those portraits. Um, I don't know. Just something to be said about the the early um, both photography and portraits of people. Just fantastic. Okay. Oh, did you know JFK went to Cho? He wasn't a very good student, was he? <laughs> In fact, they said he barely pulled a gentleman's C, managing just a 73 in French and 69 in Latin. And he was a member of the Muckers Club. Does anybody know what that means? A mucker, that's according to I think one of his professors, is a troublemaker. <laughs> so here he's there with his pals, and I guess he didn't have the best reputation as a, as a wonderful student, but he went to choke. That's pretty great. Okay. All right. Um, this is the woman I wanted to tell you who did move Rosemary Hall to Greenwich, and and she she was a headmistress, Carolyn Roots Reese. I assume that's the right pronunciation. I hope. And so she held that position from 1890 to 1938. And then, like I said, 71 moved it back to Wallingford. And she was a member of the Connecticut Woman Suffrage Association. She petitioned, picketed, and published to persuade the Connecticut General Assembly to ratify the 19th Amendment. And so the next slide will show her. She's second from the left, and she's in the colors of the organization, yellow or gold, I think it was gold, white, and purple. Just check that out. I love that picture. Look at the hats. These are all rich ladies? Um, they were, I think they were all privileged, but they were trying to work for this, this whole thing with women's suffrage. A lot of the, the wealthier women did. Um, when we talk about um, Mrs. Vanderbilt, Alva Vanderbilt, she was big on that. So we'll talk about her in a minute. Okay, next slide. Okay, International Silver Company, right? Way back when. Um, I couldn't get a picture any clearer than that, but I guess it's like a postcard, I'm assuming. Uh, so that's what the factory looked like. But but so 18, what is this, 18? If you can go back one, yeah, there you go. 1898 to 1983, thank you. So I guess they brought together a lot of existing, in this area, existing silver companies. Okay. And... Silver Museum, here it is. Okay, Franklin and Harriet Johnson's Mansion, 1866. I just, can I move there? And then I'll do a talk as much as you want. Okay, thank you, I'm moving in. All right, so of course, this was 1866. It was used in the 20th century, later 20th century for offices, 99, donated to Wallingford Historic Preservation Trust to become a new home for Meriden American Silver Museum, okay. So Meriden and Wallington were both centers uh, for silver manufacturing. And I think I'm going to be going to see that tomorrow morning. Excited to see it. Okay. All right. I, I put this woman in here because I read an article on her this past week. And it is, you know, International Women's Month. So we have to talk about women. Now, I did not know about her. Maybe many of you did, but this is really cool. She was a suffragist. Her name was Victoria Woodhull. She was the first to run for president. She didn't really, because she was underage for it, and she did, couldn't even vote. But she was bound and determined she was going to run for president. God bless her. So she was an activist and a suffragist, and she was a spiritualist. She did, um, I think she did it since she was very young. She did these um, readings for people, and, you know, I don't know how accurate she was, but she did meet the Commodore, Cornelius Vanderbilt. And because of that, she became the first female, female stockbroker on Wall Street. How about that for a, a woman going places? I was pretty impressed. Look at her outfit. Um, she just, it's almost like, it's not a top hat, but it looks like a top hat, even though it's her bonnet. And her, her garment is definitely a woman's garment, but it looks like a man's suit because it looks like an, oh, an outer coat, a shirt with a tie, and what looks like a, a vest or a waistcoat. So I love it. Early fighting women, yes. Okay, 
Next, please. Of course, Emily Warren Robley up with the Brooklyn Bridge, that whole thing. Fascinating story. Another woman with a lot of courage and a very bright woman who was not technically an engineer, but boy, could she shake things up. And look what that bridge is still doing today. And she must have known it was okay because she was the first to walk across it after it was built. So let's look at the next slide. So she was born 1843, Cold Spring, New York, influential family. Her dad was a politician in the New York State Assembly, one of 12 children, which I couldn't imagine. That's how it was back then. <clears throat> she met Colonel Washington Roebling while visiting her brother who had been in the Army, the Union Army, and she married him in 1865. Her father-in-law, John Augustus Roebling, was a world-famous architect and he specialized in suspension bridges. Unfortunately, um, even though he was assigned to build this bridge over the East River, which would eventually be the Brooklyn Bridge, he died in 1869. So Washington got the job of having to complete this as the chief engineer. But he, he developed this decompression disease from caissons, which are these big pressurized uh, things they have, had used in order to get the bridge um, I, I'm no engineer, but I know they were used, but they were pressurized and you could get decompression sickness and he did. So it almost paralyzed him. So what happened was Emily had to really, he was still home trying to work from home and they would talk about the project, but she was the one going there and working with the people who were at the construction site, going to the board meetings and being a leader and managing the project. And she said, she quotes, I have more brains, common sense, and know-how generally than any two engineers, civil or uncivil, that I've ever met. <laughs> now, that's a sentence for you. Um, Brooklyn Bridge opened May 24th, 1883. Like I said, Emily was the first one to walk across it. She gave lectures yeah. across the country and fought for women's equality. She died on February 28th, 1903 from stomach cancer, unfortunately. Uh, but 28, 2018, New York City had a, renamed a street in Brooklyn in her honor. These things come a little bit late, huh? <laughs> but it's day late and a dollar short, but that's okay. At least it happened. So that's Emily. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about a couple, couple of these powerful women. One being Carolyn Shermerhorn Astor, who was born in 1830 and lived till 1908. Um, she came from shipping money and she was an old Dutch Knickerbocker family. And she ran New York Society for quite a while. And we see her in the Gilded Age, HBO's Gilded Age uh, program, and she's played by, and I know her name, and for some reason I'm blanking out. As the day goes on, the name thing starts going down. So I know uh, Donna, thank you, Donna Murphy. She, I love her, and she, she plays Mrs. Astor. I wish they'd put her in more scenes because she's just so wonderful. But anyway, and here's the real Miss, Mrs. Astor, her portrait, which many of you have probably heard or read that when she held uh, balls or dinners or whatever, people would have to come up to her in her home and stand in front of her, and she was standing herself right under her portrait. So they had to, you know, talk about double power there. It's her on the wall and it's her right here in front of you. So, but Mrs. Astor was just, she really, you know, felt that she could, she could tell who belonged in society and who didn't. And for her, it was the whole old money thing. The whole thing with the Academy of Music was that was all old families who had money. It wasn't the new money that was coming in. Um, so we'll go next one. Um, she married William Backhouse Astor II. He was the one who was less serious than John Jacob the Third, I believe it was. And he liked to, you know, have a good time. And he was a philanderer. And so, you know, Mrs. Astor just kind of just, she just denied everything. She just pretended everything was peachy keen. That's just how she was. She didn't want anybody to know um, what was really going on. And this is Beechwood at, in Newport, and that's her, and this is Astor's Beechwood. I went to that uh, years ago when they were still doing the interpreters in costume. Any, yeah, yeah, so many yeah. of you have seen. And they would ask for your calling card. Ugh. Now you go into some of these mansions, it's still wonderful, but you, it's not the same. You know, you got to put those 
headphones on. Why did and you bring the topic? It's been a while. It's been a while. I don't know. I think I was there in either the late 80s or the early 90s. And that's when um, it, I haven't, I think they stopped it quite a while ago. In fact, I don't even think it's open now for. I think it's a part of the house. Yes, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely I right. I my talk from a, a cluster. And we yeah. just got into it, and the other people were going, are you reenactors too? You <laughs> should have fun with reenactors. Oh, I love it. I, I tell you, I would have loved that. Because, and they act like they are, it was real. I mean, they took me back to the period. You felt like you were, and you know, you look at what you're wearing, you're like, I better get out of here. I'm not trying to rest this disaster. So, okay. Um, but anyway, that um, she, I had read recently that she, um, her last year alive, she uh, went to Europe and that summer she was getting things to be ready to open Beachwood for the summer and she couldn't do it. She was too sick. And then she ended up dying not long after that. So very sad. But okay, we'll move that along. Now she had some help from a Mr. Ward McAllister, well played by Nathan Lane, a little exaggerated, but great, you know, um, and there's the real one right there. He was known as a walker. A walker was a gentleman, uh, he could be gay or not, but he would, he was safe so that he could go to events with the married women and just as sort of like a chaperone and just to make sure they'd be okay and there was no talk about a woman going alone. He had gone to Europe. He wanted to know everything about fashionable people. Now, he was related to Mrs. Astor by marriage, some cousin or whatever. I don't remember the exact connection. But uh, he learned about everything, what kind of food to serve, what you should wear, what all of the etiquette should be, every little detail. So he and Mrs. Astor partnered up. Now there's this rumor or this, this um, kind of myth about what the 400 means. He helped her come up with that. And they say, oh, it was how many people could fit in Mrs. Astor's ballroom. Not really. It was more anywhere over 400 and there couldn't possibly be that many interesting people to be in the same room. So you can't go over that number. So it was really cool. So he would go with her and he would help her to make sure she was following all of those special rules from Europe, because that's what they were doing. They, the houses, they bring over ideas or even full rooms. I know they did that in Newport from Europe so that they could copy. In fact, there's a, there's a line in the Age of Innocence, Edith Wharton, and um, uh, uh, you'll see a scene from it, but um, there's a line that says, it, it seems a shame to, um, have a new country only to be a copy of the old, something like that, a copy of the old one, that kind of thing. And that's what they were doing. So they wanted to copy the European way. Okay, let's go next. Here it is. Okay. So Lena is Carolyn Astor, Astor's nickname by her friends only, of course, and favorite walker. She dumped him after he wrote that book on all of the secrets of society and people were not happy and she dumped him. That was the end of him. And he kept making it worse. He kept talking, you know, giving the names of the 400 and all that was bad. But anyway, he was born in Savannah, 1827. He married, he was married. Um, he spent years polishing himself, like I said, court manners, architecture, clothing, food, drink, and resort spots to go to. He was considered the most complete dandy in American America. And people were categorized by him either into knobs or swells. Knobs were the old money and the fancy, fancy antecedents, whereas swells were the nouveau riche from industrialization and social climbing. So he, he didn't think much of new money, obviously. Okay, let's go next. And then you've got the Vanderbilts. What a story. Um, I was introduced to, to the whole idea of the Vanderbilts when I was about nine, and my father took us to the breakers. And back then, this is how old I am, we had to take a ferry uh, from Jamestown to Newport. The bridge wasn't up yet, so we had to take the ferry. But the I'll never forget, I was really young, but I was just blown away. That's what started this whole thing for me about the past was that day. It's just, it's something has to start somewhere. And I was so fascinated by their lifestyle and that kind of thing. But um, Cornelius, the Commodore, 
was the one who was, you know, he started out in shipping and the ferry service. And then, of course, he got into transportation and railroads. <laughs> and um, two of his sons, one married um, Alva and the other one married Alice. So Alice is the one who lived with Cornelius II in the Breakers and Alva with um, William H. Vandermilt. Mm -hmm. William K. William K. Okay, William H. I think it was William K. And they were in Marble House. So uh, Marble House was there before the Breakers. The Breakers was there, but it was rebuilt by Alice and uh, Cornelius. Okay, so we can go forward. Uh, this I threw this in here because I didn't want to forget because this was another Vanderbilt's uh, George and Edith, and this was this is the biggest mansion I've never been. Who has been to this? Is it is it fabulous? So you're saying I should go? This is, okay, okay, thank you. I need permission to be able to go. Uh, I can't even imagine how fabulous it must be inside. 1889. Can you imagine 1889? Um, okay, we've got Alva to talk about here. She was, um, she's, all of you must know, Mrs. Russell has to be based upon Mrs. Alva Vanderbilt, right? Uh, very strong opinionated, as strong as she was determined to be part of that society that was trying to keep her out. And she, you know, she, she even divorced her husband after a while and married um, Oliver Belmont, who had been a family friend. And so she just switched Newport Castles from one to the next. Um, so she was, like I said, she was very active in the suffrage movement. In fact, if you go to Marble House, they take you into the pantry, the butler's pantry, and you can see the votes for women on all the dishes and the cups. It's so cool, so, so cool. Um, this is her at, for a ball in 1883. And I think she was a Venetian princess at that time. And here she is in her later years. So she died in 1933. She lived quite a life. Okay, we'll go on from there. Here's Marble House, um, lovely home. You know that um, Marble House and I think Rosecliff were both used in the original Great Gas Gatsby from the 70s. They used those Newport mansions for that. Mm. So uh, beautiful mansion, all marble, obviously. Okay, we'll go next. Okay, so I thought it would be fun before we get into the fashion part to talk about the Gilded Age show and which rooms in Newport are used in the show. You might know this, you might not. So here goes. Marble House, look at this bedroom. This is Consuelo. Consuelo Vanderbilt was the daughter of Alva and um, William. And they arranged a marriage with the Duke of Marlborough. They sold her off. They sold her off. Yeah, they did sell. And she was very unhappy. She got rid of him and she married uh, Mr. Balsam, Balsam, B-A-L-S-A-N. And I don't blame her, you know, but and that's pretty gutsy back then. I mean, women just didn't divorce. These, these guys must have been pretty tough to live with, let's face it. No offense to the guys in here, but, but that's the bedroom they used for Mrs. Russell's bedroom. Look at that. Look at the carving on that bed post. Okay, let's see the next one, please. I, this wasn't used for anything, but look at that dining room. I could just melt right into that scene. I just, look at it. Oh, I can't. All right, that's the dining room. And this is my favorite. This is the Breakers, as you saw in the first slide. This is Cornelius II and Alice's house. 70, at least 70 rooms, maybe 73 rooms. And it's just stunning. And it's right on the water, let's face it. It's off. Bellevue Avenue. It's down um, a street, so it's a, a little bit away from the houses. It's not, you know, next to the like Marble House and all of the others are right next to one another. It's just got its own special spot there, and it's just fantastic. Okay, next, please. And this is Alice again, who lives at the Breakers. When she went to Alva's ball, she was dressed as an electric light. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Okay. Um, okay, another thing used in the show, the Breakers Music Room, which I remember from when I was nine years old, was used for Mrs. Russell's Ball when they showed that at the end of the first season. So it's fun to you know, look at this, and then when you, if you watch it again, remember that scene and see this is the room. They had to move all of the um, instruments out of the way and, and a lot of the other furnishings so that they could have a ball in there. But look at, look at the detail, the ceilings. 
look at the coffered ceiling and all of the the gilding and the carving. Just unbelievable. Okay, let's see the next room. The billiard room was George Russell's billiard room as well. Look at that. Oh, it's fantastic. Okay. The Elms kitchen was used as the Russell's kitchen. I don't know if it looks familiar to you without the other people in it, but that's what that was used for. The Elms is a lovely house to, to see too. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Gerwig's bedroom at the Elms was Gladys Russell's. So the daughter of Bertha and um, George. Pretty nice bedroom there. Okay. And then Mrs. Chamberlain, you know, um, she, Rose Cliff, this facade only was used as her house in Manhattan. So again, if you go back and, and watch it, you'll be able to see, um, say, oh yeah, now I see, you know, see the facade of that house. And there were a few other things that were used. Um, Chateau sur Mer was used on the outside, and even a staircase on the inside for, um, I think, I'm not sure whose it was, but another one's uh, staircase. Okay, move on. Rosecliff, um, Rosecliff is is one. It was the Ulrich family, and I put this up here because look at the grand stairway. Special, very special. I've been to events there, and it's unbelievable. And I belong to something called the Costume Society of America, which you join if you're going to go into this field. You just do. And what's wonderful about it is they allow you backstage, so to speak. So if you're a member and you go to an event, you get to see things that normal people don't get to see. So you kind of feel like the upper crust, you know? Mm -hmm. And one time they had an event in Providence that was a national symposium. And I got to eat dinner in, in the dining room. And I mean, the ballroom, that's the ballroom. And we had dinner in the, the ballroom in Rosecliff. I will never forget that experience. It was just unbelievable. So. I wasn't corseted, but it was, <laughs> it felt like I pretended, I pretended I was. Okay. All right. Let's get real. Um, that was not the norm. That was very few people in, in the country that had most of the money and had this rich lifestyle, but they were working, they were making money on people who came over from other countries or people who had been here for a while and working in factories. And this is the clothing that you'd see. You're not going to see rich velvets, silks, satins, um, beautiful textiles. You're going to see handmade or usually hand-me-down sometimes in families if they were big. But you're going to see cottons and linens and wools, right? You're not going to see anything fancy. And But they did try to keep with the styles of what the popular silhouettes were because they wanted to be fashionable. It doesn't mean that because they couldn't afford the clothing that the upper crust could, it doesn't mean that they didn't want to be. Look at how people em emulate designers and celebrities now. We don't all have, I don't anyway, have all the money that people in, in those situations do, celebrities and such. Um, but, you know, we still, many people want to keep up with the fashions that they see on these people, right? They're very inspired by that. And so even though they were in work dress, it's still pretty stylish when you look at it. Let's see the next slide, please. Okay, this is a very sad one. <laughs> um, it's a little blurry. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what to, but even the woman, the second from the, from the, the right, oh, this is right around the turn of the century, all right? But she's even got the, the little pompadour thing going on there, right? Look at that, even the hairdo. She's even trying to emulate that. And this is um, what happened at the turn of the century. This is this is uh, called a pigeon front um, top or bodice or blouse, if you call it a blouse. And it was it was sort of like a like a bird breast, which is why they call it a pigeon front. So she's even wearing that kind of style, but probably not in the S Ben corset that went with it. That's another story altogether. Okay. And then here's the steel workers. I mean, the man has a derby on. That's pretty stylish, you know? So, but they are in clothing that they can work in, clothing that will last. But that's why we don't see clothing from people who were in the working class. We don't see things that are this old because they wore it until it, as Seinfeld would say, just went into spores and went out the window. You know, there was nothing left of it. So you've got people who, although URI does have a pair of 18th century working 
pants in the collection and inside the pocket is historic dirt. They put it, there was dirt in the pockets and they put it in a little plastic bag and, and pinned it to the inside of the pocket. So there's still this historic dirt in there. And then another discovery, I'm kind of going on a tangent, but um, we had to do, we had to like analyze something from the collection. So this was 20th century we were doing. And, and I remember this young woman came over from Australia to take this class. She did. And we had to take, you know, garments or accessories and then do this material culture kind of study. So she, she had a tailcoat from the late Victorian period. And so she had to examine this men's tailcoat. And in the back, now you probably know this, I don't know if you know this, but the back of the tail would have a little pocket. Anybody know what would go in there? Well, um, you could, but maybe a little bit of snuff, maybe a little bit of nippy-poo of alcohol or something. But no, she went in the pocket and she said, oh, look. A block of chocolate. So there was a piece of wrapped chocolate in the pocket. So you never know what you're going to find, which can be scary. Okay. All right. You can go forward. All right. The child labor was awful. And this was going on for a long time. Um, when I was in grad school, I worked at Slater Mill, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, which was a cotton spinning mill. The coal was cotton spinning. And um, we used to tell the story of the child labor and children as, as um, young as six, if they were able, they would work in the factories because they helped support the family. We went from agriculture to this factory system. So we had children getting hurt, getting killed, um, very bad money and for very long hours and very unsafe conditions. So, um, but mills everywhere, not just in Rhode Island, but that's, I remember machines, we used to show the tourists that came in, how dangerous they could be for, for anyone and for young children. So you're seeing them in their work clothing, of course, very sturdy, but I'm sure it fell apart after so many years of working or they outgrew it. I think he said a rip on his shoulder. Yeah. And that's before the uh, cold shoulder style came in in the <laughs> 90s. So I don't think that was a fashion statement. Okay, to the next one. Okay, the other thing is, you know, the child labor, it was just, not only were they not making much money, the living conditions. In a factory system, they had mill houses. But in New York, the people who worked in New York City, now we're talking tenements because the real, real estate, the Vanderbilt real estate, it was like, you know, it was like a slumlord, really. And they were packing more because when the immigration became um, much more constant and more and more people coming into the country, now you've got no place to put them. So now you're stacking people in, you know, one room in a big giant tenement, or, you know, I read that they, they you might even have a whole family in one small, like crazy small space because they had nowhere else to live. So um, these are the kinds of conditions that you know, they had to make all of their own clothing. They couldn't go to, they couldn't even afford to go to stores once the department stores came. They didn't, it wasn't like today where it's much more democratic. Okay, we're up to the next. Uh, this is an example of what the tenements might look like. And, you know, you're crowding families upon families upon families into these. And people had a lot of children back then. And they were all in one place. It was, it was often dirty and unsafe and poorly ventilated. So those are the kinds of things when we're looking at the Gilded Age, this was also going on at the same time. So just a kind of depressing thought, but it, it is what the majority of, of people were experiencing in New York City, especially. Okay, all right, let's go back to the rich people. It's more fun to talk about. All right, um, I can't not, when we get into the clothing, which you're gonna do right now, I have to talk about Charles Frederick Worth because he was, known as the father of couture. He was an Englishman that opened a um, fashion design house in France and uh, in Paris. And he worked with the upper classes. He uh, designed for Princess Eugenie and she loved him. So this was the 1850s. And so she started wearing his designs and all the other women of her class wanted to dress like her. So 
And then that filtered over here. And so his designs were so um, incredibly beautiful and, and intricate. It was perfect for the Gilded Age. And so women of the upper classes would actually go to Paris to be fitted for worth gowns or order things from here, trousseaus, that kind of thing. And um, they wanted their, par the, their Paris fashion from him. So he was a big, big part of this whole Gilded Age fashion scene. And you can see how detailed and how much beautiful work is put into each and every piece. Okay, we can go to the next one. All right, and then the other thing about fashion is, you know, department stores were really going to ramp up in the Gilded Age. Um, they started earlier than that as um, more like almost like general stores. You know, they weren't the big department stores we know today. And look at the old R.H. Uh, R. Macy's. This was an early version of Macy's. And then next we have Lord and Taylor. And that early version is over there in 1826. And then 1853, we have this newer, more opulent version. Um, there's a there's two things. The, uh, Paradise was a series that came out a few years ago about um, the 1870s. I think it was the 1870s and this beautiful department store and about the women who worked there, the shopkeepers who worked there. The other one that you've got to see if you haven't seen him is Mr. Selfridge. Mm -hmm. It's just divine. It's just divine. I, I, I can't even. It was so well done, and um, you really see what was going on in that world, how important it was to have someone pull out a whole box of gloves for you to choose what you wanted. And I was telling my uh, boss when I, I taught in Boston for eight years, and my boss said to me, ah, I said, well, oh, wouldn't it be great to go in the department store like that again? And, have that service. She goes, ah, you get mad if you had to wait that long. <laughs> She's saying, hurry up, hurry up. But it was a whole different world. Now you go in, you can't even find somebody to help you half the time, right? It's changed, but that's depressing too. We won't talk about it. Okay. Macy's in 1858 and in 1924. Look at the change right there. Um, just, it's where women would go and shop. And Ladies Mile in Madison Avenue in New York was very big during the Gilded Age and everybody wanted, and it was a safe place women could go and spend an afternoon shopping, maybe having tea um, and, and you know, doing womanly things and kind of being social at the same time. And Mr. Selfridge is, is, is Mr. Selfridge, that show is very good at showing you all of that as well. Okay. All right, let's look at the clothes. So we... What happened in the, I'm not going to go through the whole 60s, but after the war, because that's pretty much when we started with the Gilded Age, <clears throat> we're looking at the 50s were wide, 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 very, very big skirts. And the development of that page crinoline or hoop skirt helped women get that big, big, wide skirt and not have to drag around a dozen petticoats to get that. So that helped. But at the end of the 60s, what happened is you started to see that big bell flatten in the front and get longer in the back. It's going to start getting longer, longer and longer. And so if you pick up a, a dress from the 1860s, true dress from the 1860s, the, the front will be shorter than the back because you're starting to see that lengthening. And that's going to set us up for the bustle. So the bustle period is my favorite, and that's it's wonderful. Um, so that's what you're seeing in the late 60s is that development. The other thing that was popular in the 60s was this geometric design, and I have a piece I'm going to show you later. Uh, but that geometric design um, as decoration on dresses and down sleeves, that was very popular. So it was plaid. And think about Queen Victoria with Balmoral and, and being really into plaid. So people were watching, you know, what, paying attention to what she was doing too. Okay. All right. So here we go. Here's two more 1860s dresses. So you can see you, it's not that wide in the front at all. And you're seeing this definite um, lengthening going on back here. Uh, here's your stripes. That was another geometric or stripe kind of design, very popular in the 60s. 
Okay. Um, next one, please. Okay. <clears throat> Shoes in the 60s, you could have walking boots like that or a fancier dancing slipper. And this has been going on forever. You know, the change, the, what you'd wear during the day as opposed to what you'd wear at night. Um, you've heard, I'm sure, if you were part of that society 400, you better have a lot of changes of clothes every day because it mattered what you wore at different times of the day. Something to wear in the morning, something to wear if you're going to go calling on someone with your calling card. You might not even go in. You'll just give the footman your card, so that's a visit. If you didn't feel like seeing the person, well, I stopped by. It's like calling and hope you get the answer machine. It's the same kind of thing, you know. So, uh, but yeah. So, it, it, if you, let's say you went to uh, you were staying at someone's house in the New York mansion, let's just say, and you're staying for the weekend. Well, you better have everything because you might be in England, especially because the sporting that went on. So, let's say you were going to Highclere Castle, Downton Abbey. Think about that. You've got to have the morning clothing. You've got to have promenade, afternoon clothing. Um, if you're going to play a sport or go hunting, you have to have a different costume for that. Maybe a tea gown for when you have tea later in the day. And then a dress for dinner. And then if you're going to the opera, that's another change. Or if there's a ball. So that demanded a lot of different. So keep that in mind as you're looking at, at some of these things. It wasn't like now we just throw sneakers and, and jeans and a t-shirt in your suitcase and you're done, right? You can wear the same thing for a week. Who cares? But um, back then, that, that would have mattered. Okay. Um, all right. I can't not talk about men. I know this is International Women's Month, but, you know, the poor guys, they had deserved to see what was worn, too. Look at those top hats. I have one a beaver top hat over there. It's not a stovetype one. It's not that stovetype. Stovepipe. Uh, it's not that tall, but it is a beaver-made hat. Um, I love the fashion for men in this period. It's just... It's elegant, and they were starting to wear plaids in their in their pants, in their pants, in the vests. They were getting a little bit more daring with dress, which I love. In the eighteen sixties, lots of facial hair, lots of the mutton chops and beards and and mustaches and all of that. This is a daguerreotype. You know, Louis Daguerre is the one really who started photography for us. So this is a daguerreotype, and um, that was just you know they couldn't smile. Why couldn't they smile? Too long, you'd be frozen forever. And but yeah, that it was just it took a long time for the um, the camera to do its thing. So, um, and I I love it because I always talk about this when I talk about the Jane Austen era. Look at the men's hair. So if you can see that it's a little poof, and then it's a little almost like the Larry Fine from the Three Stooges over here, <laughs> like this. Why did they do that? Anybody want to guess? The hat, you put the top hat, you don't want hat hair. So what it does is it keeps this part under the, the top hat and see the side? There you go. So there's your, there's your do. So, you know, some of you men might want to bring that back. You don't have to put the top hat on. Just wear that, see what happens. Just wear that little hairdo. All right, okay. Um, again, the, the glamour of the well-dressed gentleman. I don't know what to tell you. I just love it. Um, the top hat. Now, later in the 19th century, the, the stylish young men will be wearing derbies. And, but the top hat will be day wear for, the, for men for a long time, the, the older men. Um, but then the younger men will go into the derbies for day wear, and the top hat would become formal eventually. But you, know, you see this contrasting, instead of just the same color for the suit, you see the contra contrasting pants and all of that. Um, and this is actually morning dress. So what he would walk around town with if he's out in the morning. Okay. Oh, and that's uh, another photography piece of this gentleman who's um, uh, must be, I bet it was after he finished his apprenticeship, right? After seven years. That's what I think that probably is. That's his, his trade. Okay, next one. Here's a daguerreotype, that's Louis Daguerre. Um, if you're lucky enough to find one of these beautiful cases in, a, in an antique store, you never know. You you can find these things, and they can be very expensive, um, but you can also get good deals on them. And if you can get one that just hasn't faded too much, it's kind of fun to add to your decor. 
And that way, with photography, you know, you had to be very wealthy to have a portrait or a likeness done until this. Then most people could have, they could afford to have um, a picture taken. And they'd get in their best dress, right? They might have only had one good set of clothing, but they'd wear that for the photographer. Okay. All right, let's talk about bustles. We're getting there. The bustles of the 1870s and 80s, there were three basic types. Okay, the first one, 1870s, um, I think it was like 73, 74 to 78-ish, was more like a waterfall. See that manipulation of fabric? Think about curtain or um, curtain window treatments, how you kind of puff them up and manipulate the fabric, right? Um, so there was some structure to it, but it was softer looking, okay? In the 78 and early 80s, all of the decoration and fullness went down the skirt. You see that? It's down here now. And they've got something that's called a purist bodice, which is very tight around the hips. Can you imagine what kind of corset that had to entail? Do they have to wear for that? Come on. I mean, that's pretty tight, but I love it. And you're going to see um, examples of this in some videos that I have for you. The coolest one, in my opinion, though, is the 1880s, 85, 86. It's like a shelf. It's so structured and stiff. It looks like you could put a tea tray on it. And you've seen paintings, I'm sure, with these kinds of images. Um, and check out the hats. The hats have all kinds of feathers. The neckline, the neck was so high, they had to wear their hair up, you know, to kind of balance out that big old butt. You know, you had to have something that was a little higher on the top. And so they had these updos with these great hats. Okay, next scene. Uh, okay, so this is the, uh, the 1870s again, much softer, as you can see. This is October 1870. Uh, these are fashion plates that you've, I'm sure, heard of. They were drawings, and they were colored in um, of the latest fashions coming out of Paris, usually. So very soft. So day wear, of course, was covered up, and evening wear, you could actually show your shoulders. Okay, the next one is, oh, this is a work dress on the right, um, uh, talk about detail in this dress. And the other thing about the 1870s is they came out with these aniline dyes, um, I think in the 1850s, but they started to really use them and they were very bright. So if you see like a peacock blue or bright, bright purple, if you see there, those synthetic dyes were really vibrant, but they weren't color fast. So I remember seeing pieces in the collection and it was a child's bodice, peacock blue. And when you looked on the inside, it was much, much brighter because it just faded. So they weren't color fast, that was the problem, but lots of colors. The other thing is around this time, um, they started adding uh, attachments to sewing machines. So now they could make trims at home and anything they could throw on those dresses, they did. Tassels and, and you know, ribbons and all kinds of things just hanging off the dresses because they could. And when you see a couple of the bodices over there, you'll see what I mean. It's fantastic. Okay, next, please. Um, this is the peacock blue I'm talking about. You can see layers and layers of um, fabric coming down here. And it's just, just amazing. This was very popular. Um, this sort of pleating at the bottom was very popular during the, especially the 18, uh, late 1870s and into the 1880s. Look at those beautiful embroidered boots, day walking boots. Um, oh, I mean, again, they, they're still there because I'm sure they weren't worn for very long. They were preserved well. Um, they weren't walked in dusty streets for too long. So they were able to be we say they might have only been worn once. Who knows? My finger is just pointing. <laughs> um, what is a tea gown? A tea gown is, I love the stripe effect, but a tea gown is something that gave a woman who's going to be at home relief from tight lacing. So if she was having friends for tea, for afternoon tea, she could wear a tea gown. Doesn't mean she didn't corset, but it, it wasn't happening to be as tight because it was a looser dress. 
I just love that. So it gave that little bit of it. And it's almost like the 18th century Watteau back. If you look at that, isn't that fantastic? Oh, just beautiful. But you can see it's a little bit looser and more forgiving to the figure. Okay. Um, Gobi's Ladies Book, that came out, that was one of the first uh, ladies magazines. And initially, it was not just fashion. It was household tips. It was cooking ideas. It was how to keep a household. And it, you know, but it also had fashion and fashion ideas and ideas for um, accessories and how to make your own, etc. And this is a, whoops. Yeah, it's okay. This was 1878. And so it started in 1830, Gobi's, and went to 1878. This is actually that exact thing I was telling you about, the fullness being almost behind the knees at this period with this very tight over bodice called the purest bodice. And see all the attachments? Look what they've done on them. There's all kinds of stuff hanging around. We've got this lace, we've got bows, we've got, oh. It's great, but a lot of work. Okay. Late 70s again. Look at these beautiful gowns, these ladies. Look at that evening gown she's wearing. Um, they had to have ladies' maids. How could you get into this by yourself? It's impossible. And get out of it. So um, ladies needed ladies' maids. And to wear this kind of a garment, you'd have to. Now, that's a small waist. But keep in mind, that's a drawing. Doesn't mean they didn't have tight corseting. But our lady right here, that's a pretty small waist. And that is, um, I don't think it's airbrushed. I think it's a real, real photograph. But very, very tight lacing for this period. And again, the corset would go all the way down, keep the hips nice and tight there. Okay, next please. 1870s men, you're still seeing some mutton chops on the women, the men. And um, just, <laughs> but you're going to start to see as we move up into the later part of the 80s and 90s that you're going to see more derbies, but you're still seeing the top hats, walking sticks, the canes were very popular as well. Chesterfield coats for men were also becoming popular, so with the velvet collar, that's such a classic. Now that's used by women and men, but back then it was just a men's coat. Okay, let's see. All right, this is a clip from the Age of Innocence, and I waited this long because I wanted, when I, you see them in motion, I wanted you to be able to see the clothing move after I've shown it to you on the screen. Does that make sense? So that's why I waited. Okay, so hopefully this is loud enough. This is um, Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence on screen. I think it came out in 91. This is the ball scene. So here we go. And look at the late 70s dresses. See all the behind the knees? Oh. Archer had not stopped at the spot the young men usually did. But came directly to the boathouse. Could you hear it? The announcement of his engagement to divert gossip away from the countess and show his most ardent support for May and her whole family. The Beaufort house had been boldly planned. Instead of squeezing through a narrow passage to get to the ballroom, one marched solemnly down a vista of insulated drawing rooms. <laughs> Passing through the crimson drawing room, could one see the return of spring? The much discussed nude by Bouguereau, which Bouguereau had the audacity to hang for himself. Archer enjoyed such challenges to convention. He questioned conformity in private, but in public he upheld family and tradition. This was a world balanced. 
itself a beautiful state, but its harmony could be shattered by this On the whole, Archer was amused by the smooth hypocrisies of his peers, he was even envy of them. Lawrence Leffitz, for instance, was New York's foremost authority on form, and his opinion on pumps versus patent leather husbands had never been disputed. On matters of surreptitious romance, his skills were unquestionably plain. <laughs> Old Mr. Sillett and Jackson was as great an authority on family as Lawrence Leffitt's was on form. The mean and melancholy history of Countess Olenska's European marriage was a buried treasure he hastened to excavate. He carried, like a calling card, an entire register of the scandals and mysteries that had smoldered under the unruffled surface of society for the last 50 years. <laughs> Julius Beaufort's secret was the way he carried things on. He could arrive casually at his own party if he were another guest, <laughs> and might also leave early for a more modest but comforting address in the East 30s. Beaufort was intrepid in his business, and his personal appearance had some relaxation. Archer's fiance was innocent of all these intrigues and of much else. May Welland represented for Archer all that was best in their world, all that he honored, and she offered him to it. So it, it's long, I know, but it gives you that feel. Um, I love how they, you know, she says you, know, you had to march solemnly through these small drawing rooms to get to the actual ballroom. It's just fascinating. And this movie really showed not only what they wore, but what they used. You know, they would zoom in on, you know, a certain cigarette case or something that somebody was using. And that draws you in because it's the whole, uh, the whole thing, not just the clothing on your back, but also what you lived with from day to day. So very interesting. Next slide, please. Whoops. <laughs> we could watch it again. All right, here's your 1880s. Here's your button. Now that is extreme. Um, <laughs> it does require quite a structure under there because um, it, that's not a manipulation of fabric, that's for sure. So sometimes it, would, it was an entire page. Um, so if you wanted this, you might <laughs> that came out like this, and then it would you put a structure right here. So that would give this really flat feeling, and then this would be the rest of the bustle right here. It's really cool. Um, I believe it, I have one, but I couldn't fit it with all my things. It's called the lobster tail bustle. So it, it makes this form like this, and you tie it. It has two little ties, and you would tie it around you so that it stays in that shape. Otherwise, it's going to be flopping around. Um, but yes, but look at the, the posture and just, I have some beautiful fans over there that be sure to see this one painted and then there's some little ostrich feather fans that are gorgeous. How would yeah. you two gallon one of those? Good question. Um, they were flexible and two things. First of all, they did, some of them did collapse, but a woman could never, a lady wasn't supposed to put her back against the chair, the seat at all. She always sat forward. So even if there's that little bit of, you know, something going on back there. Like at the edge of the chair. Kind of yes. Thing. And then some of them, they would move it over. So they would move the whole <laughs> bottom part of the skirt. Not the butt, but it doesn't sound good, does it? No. But they move that whole part of the bustle. And they show a scene with um, Michelle Pfeiffer's character, the Countess Aleska. 
Alenska, she's um she's moving her whole half dress. You've probably seen that scene, and she sits down. But yeah, they were more flexible than you would think for sure. Um, they had um caning. A lot of them had the cane, and and then some of them did have the steel hoops as well. But that was more. I think of the steel hoops as as more in um the the wider skirts of the 1850s. But the caning was was very hot. Sometimes the boning, like the flexible boning as well. Okay, let's see the next one. I feel like, to, oh, this is an example um, of what, how you could get that shelf, you know? Um, and there's your long corset, people. So if you want to order one, <laughs> and then, you know, just practice sitting like I told you to. Don't put your back against the seat at all, ever again. In fact, a lot of women, when corsets started to go south, you know, when people didn't want to wear them anymore, the older women didn't want to stop because it supported them. And they did. They were so used to the corset, they didn't have the abdominal strength themselves to hold themselves up. The corset did the work. So they didn't want to get rid of them. Imagine that. So maybe you don't want to try that again. You want to keep doing your crunches and, you know, stay strong. Anytime there's a fashion that is extreme, you're going to see cartoons. Always, always, always. So this is what they was considered like a snail. Um, between the high hats and hairdos and the big old bustle, it certainly is a true, uh, very well done drawing of um, making fun, as they did with, with so many things. Okay, next please. Um, 1880s, Bustle America, you're seeing um, these images. I love this one with the gun. Oh, and, um, but they're in, in 80s costume. And this, you can always tell that, you know, these family uh, photos, you can see all of the buttons that went down on those long 1880s bodices. And you can also see, a lot of times in the 1880s, you'll see a separate piece of fabric, almost like an overskirt but almost looks like an apron. And that's very popular. And the difference between the 70s and 80s, the 80s didn't have trains. The, their regular dresses didn't. They had the big bustle, but they didn't usually have a train. It was usually even all the way around. So that's another way to tell how uh, 70s and 80s. Okay, let's see what else. Oh, there's some more. Now, I was telling, I think I was telling Rachel earlier, um, I have a, not as long as this, but I have a beautiful cape this fringe, this sort of that chenille kind of a uh, fringe that was very popular for furniture and in fashion, I have a beautiful cape. I can't find it. I've looked in every closet. Believe me, I, my husband has a half a closet. I have the rest of the closet and the basement. Couldn't find it. And I know it's there somewhere. I just couldn't find it. But it's a shorter cape, but it does have that room for the bustle. So it would have like this, it would have gone right over in 1880s bustle, very cool to see. And then of course some walking shoes over there that you have ties. Okay, let's see next. Okay, and then the last video I have, we're almost done, is the um, ballroom scene. And the, the last episode of season one. So we know this is the music room. Can I go back? No? How come it's so low? Mrs. Russell, George Russell. Oh, that's better. Ward McAllister. Recognize the room at all from that picture I showed you? Look at that. The 
Okay. Plus, these balls went on all night, right? It was dawn by the time people left. So what, okay, what period would you say? There were a couple types of bustles that I saw. Yeah, want to take a guess? Well, we know that, well, we know when the show was supposed to be. So you could say early 80s, right? 81, 82. But, so I, I saw some that were still low because it was 78 to around 83, so, right? So that was correct. But there were some shelf-like bustles. Did you see that? People like Mrs. Russell or Alva Vanderbilt, if someone like Mrs. Astor, first of all, might order from Worth the latest fashion, but would put it away until the next year because she didn't want to be too vulgar. <laughs> Not Mrs. Russell or Mrs. Vanderbilt. They went ahead and that fashion came in, they're going to wear it. So that's why you see that um, difference in the two different types of bustles. Okay, one more, two more slides, I think. Here's our men in the 1880s. I see some derbies popping up here, but we still see a lot of top hats. Um, and I, look at the, the coats, all of those beautiful coats that the overcoats the men are wearing. Uh, now they're down. Many of the younger men got rid of the big old mutton chops, and now they just have the mustache. Whereas the older men you might see in the older styles um, of the facial hair as well. So lots of interesting looking suits. All kind of like the coat and the frock coat, which were originally um, during the Victorian period. Now you're seeing all different types of styles. In the 1860s, they came out with the sack jacket, which was the precursor to the sport coat. And the sack jacket was looser and it was usually worn with contrasting trousers not like a suit that would be the same uh, fabric as the pants, um, you know, both jacket and pants. So um, they were starting to get a little more adventurous with patterns and styles as well. And this was 1889, 9, and 1890 in August. Okay. Sportswear. And that's the last thing I think I really want to talk about. You had sportswear was actually for the sport you were playing or taking part in. Now sportswear is what we wear every day, right? That's the sportswear department. You go in there, everything's sportswear now, right? It's casual every day. But back then, it was very specific. So if you were going to be playing golf, you wore probably knickerbockers and you know still wear a shirt and tie and jacket, it could be a bow tie. Um, if you were going horseback riding, you wore riding clothes, a riding habit if you were a woman. If you were hunting, you had another whole set of clothing for that. Uh, bicycling, which was all the rage in the 1890s, and that was, um, they had bicycling costumes, and one version of that was, they were trousers, they weren't trousers, they were bifurcated, so they were two legs, but they were so wide, they looked like a skirt, and so those kinds of things were, and but some women still wore skirts to ride their bicycles, regular long skirts, they must have gotten caught in those pedals, I don't know how they did it, but um, but they, you know, definitely specific for sports. So you see men much more casual here in that situation. Okay. And then a couple of other things. Aesthetic dress was also the 1880s and 90s. They were really tired of all of this um, trussed up fashion. They wanted something that was more real and more artistic and more aesthetic to their in their eyes. So. Um, somebody like Oscar Wilde was a major proponent of this fashion. So it was more Renaissance based. Um, and even here, when you look at it's more like a, like a tea gown style, but it's in more of a Renaissance style sleeve. So you're starting to see um, more of this, what we would call a style tribe now. Certain segments of the population would be into this kind of dress as opposed to what the majority of people were wearing. And that was it, the pre raphaelite movement, uh, movement was this group of painters, and they didn't like the direction English art was going in in the 1840s. So it all started there. So very interesting. Okay, let's look next. And then last decade is the 90s, and look at those sleeves. This is called the leg of mutton sleeve because it looks like a big old leg of lamb. And again, you know, the biggest sleeves are worn by the wealthiest women, not only because they could afford the fabric, 
but also because they didn't have to do any labor. If you're in a factory and you're wearing sleeves that big, something's going to get caught somewhere and you're going to get hurt. So, um, you know, working women still wore the fashion, but it might not have been extreme if they were going to work in it. So, but look at the um, incredible work that, oh, they do. Okay, sorry, I heard something that the library is. <laughs> we got to get you people out of here. All right. Um, but I love this style. I do have, I think, three 1890s bodices over there in varying condition. Um, two of them I got at an auction last summer. And one, I don't even remember where I got it. I don't even remember, but it's it's bright blue. It's beautiful. It's got some damage, but it, you must see those bodices for sure. Is she walking? Um, it looks like a, a very big ostrich fan. The ones I have are very small, but they did have giant fans, and ostrich fans were very popular back then. Yeah. Okay, let's see the next. Uh, again, that's a fashion plate, so that look how small that was. It's like, it's like a pencil. The waist is like this big. Um, and look at those sleeves. She looks like she's going to take off. It looks like a butterfly. And the parasols, I've got two over there that are gorgeous. Make sure you see them. They were very tall. And so that must be from this period. I've also got a carriage parasol, which folds so that you could take it on the carriage and then in the carriage. And then when you get out, you'll be able to put it at its full length. Oh, beautiful. Look at the sleeve. This is a work gown. This was a wedding gown on the 1890s. And just so intricate. And the, just the lace and all of this embroidered work, damask. Ugh. And look at the condition. I mean, it's still still with us. So fast fashion, it is not. That's for sure. Um, here's some bicycling outfits here. Uh, women in a long skirt playing tennis. Now, there were tennis scenes in Newport in the Gilded Age that I'm sure you've seen. And uh, so you do see men in their whites, their tennis whites and all of that. Um, this was a uh, corset of, of more sport corset looser, not as rigid as that boning they would have in, in regular clothing corsets. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can see that. It's kind of dark, but those are all different sports. You can see the big bicycle over there. Swimming was starting to be coming. People weren't just waiting anymore, which used to be called bathing. They were actually starting to get more interested in moving about and swimming. So the costumes were going to change for that reason, too. And here's a woman in a Looks like a shorter skirt. Um, it might be a skirt. I can't tell if it's over uh, more of like a little trouser outfit, but she's got the big sleeves even for bike riding. I love it. Um, I just can't. Look at the, the hats. So they didn't wear helmets, obviously, in those days. They, they took their chances with their little fancy hats instead. But yeah, definitely a big deal in the 1890s to have uh, bicycling be a part of daily life. Okay, and a look at that. I don't know if that's a worth or not, but it certainly looks like it should be a worth if it isn't. Um, by the way, you'd be happy to know that the collars, those high collars, and into the early 20th century as well, could very well be boned. So not all, all, you're not only boned here, Oh, you boned up here too. So no wonder they look so proud because they couldn't move their heads. They couldn't move their necks. If you went like this, you could give yourself a stabbing in the old neck or throat. So um, yeah, a lot of times there's boned necklines as well. Too. Talk about posture. Um, and then this was very big in the 90s. Women were going out and working more. Women were participating in sports. They wanted to be comfortable, and they were jealous of how well men's tailors, tailored clothing was, how well made it was. They wanted clothing like that. So the tailor made was made by a tailor instead of a dressmaker. And it was tailored to the woman's body, and it was, it could be a, a tailor-made suit, could be a traveling suit, it could be a promenade suit or dress, but it was tailored. And that was a very a big part of the 1890s fashion. It was also the era when the, the Gibson girl started with the high pompadour hair and the, um, you know, again, the high neck and just that very small waist still. That didn't go away and it won't for a while. Um, look at the sleeves here in this photograph of this woman. That's 1895. Yeah. 
more jokes about the sleeves because again it's it's also very um extreme so it was it's cool because it's sports that it's all about sports so they're just throwing the rackets in there and balloons and oars and everything else that they can just great i love the day wear too on the left in the bonnets they everything they could put on the bonnets they did sometimes whole birds until the audubon society had to put a stop to it because they were killing too many birds i know it's bad okay um, Gibson girl, like I talked, there's a chat files being a Gibson illustration on the left. So if the shirt waist is what I talked about earlier tonight, and that was worn with a skirt, and that was a great working outfit for, for ladies and more casual wear. So the shirt waist and the, the skirt going with it. And you could have a, a dressier shirt waist, or you could have something that was um, a little bit more casual, like you see on these ladies. Okay, next. Uh, men, 1890s, gone to the beards. It's all about the mustache. And the derbies are in much higher uh, demand. Than, and the top hat is still popular, but again, mostly for the older gentlemen and less for the younger men. Um, and there's a nice, probably a wedding portrait or an engagement portrait, this couple right here. From the 1890s, you can see that sleeve, all the embroidery, probably beading that she has on the bodice and on the cuffs of her dress. And um, I love this. This is another um, photography, you know, early photography, but you're seeing this is an 1890s woman with her family. And she's got the big sleeves, big sleeves holding a book, which was very common when, when people had their photographs taken. Um, the men's suits are fantastic. He's got his walking stick. And um, again, not much. The older gentleman would be more likely to have the facial hair than the younger one. That's actually an 1890 shoe, if you can believe it. Um, yeah, so you're not only corseted and probably corseted here too, but you got to walk around in those babies. Not the norm. Not the norm. It might have been a sample of, you know, shoe or something. I can't imagine a woman spending much time in those, but who knows? 1890s was the gay 90s. It was crazy. Anything, anything was okay. Anything and everything. This was more likely um, to be worn as this day pump. Um, very scrappy. That was very popular in the 1890s. This went into the early 1900s as well. This beautiful embroidered metallic beading on shoes. You'll see that. I have a pair from the um, early 20th century at home, um, that incredible condition that they're in. And some boots as well. I have a couple pair of boots over there. One we've determined it's men's, it's not women's, because it's a little bit bigger in the foot than a woman would have worn. And I have two button hooks over there. I have one longer one that probably for shoes, and then a really small one that could have been for bodice buttons and gloves. So you can check out both of those over there. But I love these 1890 shoes. Fantastic. And I I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, they're giving me the names. It's 1899. That's all I know. Um, God bless them. You know, <laughs> on a bike. Must have been one of those. You know when you can go and get it dressed up and be in a different era? That's what I guess what it looks like. I don't know what's going on. Okay. Um, and then finally, like I said, the Gilded Age started dying down. This is, of course, Mark Twain. In 1873, he wrote about the Gilded Age and all of its excesses, right? And that was in the kind of in the beginning of it. But then we had a book towards the end, um, Jacob Reese, How the Other Half Lives. And that's where you see this. And the horrors, which nobody wanted to see if you were in those upper classes, came crashing down and the reality of it, of slum life, um, of the politicians being crooked. Much has changed, I know. <laughs> but, and so they really started to um, bear down on improving these conditions of the tenements because these pictures will tell you how many people they were fitting and living in one room and if they were even living indoors. I mean, who knows um, where they were, but very rough life, very small space to live. So that's when we really started to see the Gilded Age start to slowly decline on a slippery slope. Is that what Bill's going to do today? Yes. 
that was part of it. That and the fact that we had the 19, 1893 um, the recession, I guess it was, and then in 1896, you saw this whole political change and going towards this progressive era into the turn of the century, into the 20th century. So yeah, it was part of the, the end of the whole thing. And um, you know, people were starting, they lost money during that whole crash and um, recessionary period. So, you know, it wasn't thriving like it had been. And the reality of what was really going on behind the scenes really woke people up. And they started saying, we've got to help people and you know, get them out of these kinds of conditions. And Mrs. Astor died, I think, in 1908. So she was the queen of, uh, you know, society and she was no more. And, and things really started to change after that. And... It was long, I know. I um, I wanted to make sure I included everything. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I really wanted to make sure that I included as much about this area as I could. Um, I do have a website. It's, it's, I don't know why the M's over there, but spiritsoffashion.com. I didn't put them out, but I will. I've got flyers and cards if you wanted to. If you know anyone who wants a presentation of any era, I can um, give you that the list of those presentations I have. And my actual email is there too. So, um, but I will thank you for coming and ask. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're a great audience. Does anybody have questions? I know it's been a long, yes. 